Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Hope you had a great break. I know some people are still filtering in. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, we are now going to do a town hall, Ask the Experts. We've got three of our speakers from the last two days back up here with me. Um, you saw Laura and Kate both this morning, and then Steve joined us yesterday. So I've gone through a lot of the questions you all have submitted over the last two days, specifically ones that we did not get a chance to ask. So now we're going to ask those of this group. We're also very happy to take additional questions. So if you go into the app, if you want to submit more questions to me, I'm going to be checking them on the iPad up here as we go. Um, so submit, submit away, and we'll, we'll get started. So first one, since I'm holding the iPad, I'm going to ask a question that I have, <laughs> uh, which is I noticed that the first two panels that we had today were female speakers. And so I'm wondering, is there a correlation between responsible investing and an increased interest in women? Um, is that something that was just a coincidence, or is that something, and Kate, I'm going to throw this to you. Yeah, Where's so, the correlation there? So this is always fun and controversial. Um, there was a paper, there is science on this. Um, about, I think it, was, it came out about a year ago in the journal Consumer Research, and what they found is that the idea of eco-friendly behaviors and femininity are actually linked culturally in the West. Um, and so if, a, again, sorry for the controversy, but they do have the data, um, that if a man feels threatened in his masculinity, he is less likely to engage in eco-friendly behavior of any kind. Um, you don't have this problem for women because it's a feminine-normed behavior. Um, and so what they then find is that you can, you can actually draw more men into sustainable behaviors by framing, them, framing it as a masculine behavior, right? So aligning it with other masculine gender norms like protection or um, provision or strength or extremity. Um, but so my you, test was really cool. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Unbelievably yeah. cool. Well, if, and, and if you look at, you look at the, I mean, so when they had the big release recently, they had a man there, you know, throwing the rock into the glass, right? <laughs> but they, they have flipped that narrative to say this is a masculine behavior. And so, you know, the fact that we're all up here talking about this, who knows? And it probably suggests that the men who are here are very confident in their masculinity. So well done. <laughs> <laughs> Nice compliment for Steve there. Um, Can you call my wife with that one? Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> we'll send her this clip. Yeah, please do. Thank you. I mean, I can add also just please. from the investor perspective. I mean, there's not necessarily evidence in terms of you know the asset levels coming from you know female versus male clients, but we do anecdotally see um, interest coming from female clients, especially around topics of equality, gender equality. That of course does resonate not only with women, but um, that is a topic that we get, get a lot of uh, good reception on. And I would just also make the comment that women are going to be very important in terms of driving sustainable investing forward. Uh, you know, we look toward future wealth levels. Women are increasingly occupying a greater share of wealth, and they're going to continue to mm. do so. Uh, women are more likely than men to have college degrees now. So uh, we expect to see women's earning potential also continue to rise. One other interesting thing I'll throw out there, not to scare the men in the room, if I haven't scared you enough, uh, women tend to outlive their husbands. So when you think about legacy planning, which tends to line up well with uh, impact investments, thinking about what you want to you know, leave future generations, how you want to leave your mark, uh, a lot of those decisions are going to be in women's hands as well. So they're definitely going to be very important to the space uh, as we move forward. And Kate, you know, definitely love your comments in terms of it really <laughs> tending to resonate uh, from that perspective. So very interesting. Now that we talked about gender, let's talk about another fun one, politics. Um, so with the U.S. pulling out of the Paris Climate Accord, do you see that there's been an increased focus in ESG or impact investing at companies um, or with investors? And, and Steve, let's, take, let's give that one to you. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think what, what has occurred is that if people forget sometimes about really the impact of the federal government on climate and, and um, what it really does. It certainly has impacts at the EPA level. But most climate regulation is actually done at the state and local level. Mm -hmm. So that really hasn't changed much. If anything, it's gone the opposite direction of becoming more um, rigid, regardless of the, the political indications of the state. And, and that's one of the things that I have found in talking to investors is some of the investors that are most interested in, in ESG and impact investing are actually would consider themselves more conservative because they're looking at this from a different lens mm -hmm. but just want to come to the same outcome that – you know, we're not as divided on the environment, I think, as our political leaders make us appear to be. Um, I'm from a very small town in upstate New York, and all of my friends and their families all go hunting. Like, I, I never did, but my family did, um, or my friends did, and they're passionate about conserving the environment. And they look at it in a different way, and 
you know, I, I go back to, you know, Steve Mnuchin's confirmation hearing, which I thought was fascinating because Charles Grassley literally killed him about wind power. And that was the only topic that he started with and, and hammered him on to get Mnuchin to agree that wind power was an important future for the country because of how important wind is to Iowa. And when you think about a lot of the states that are really growing rapidly for wind, it's the more what would consider to be red states. It's the middle part of the country led by Texas. So in, in it's important from a financial perspective because the farmers are making a tremendous amount and, and ranchers are making a tremendous amount of money from wind and the turbines don't bother their cows or mm -hmm. their plants or their farms. So it's a really important factor. And I think when we, when I speak to investors that would consider themselves more, more conservative politically, the environment isn't controversial to them. Mm -hmm. they, they are very understanding and passionate about trying to preserve the environment. Um, it's just, I think the way it's talked about isn't really reflective of how people actually think about it. Kate, you want to add something there? I was going to say, it's, a, it's another framing issue. So, mm -hmm. so we also know that if you frame an, a sustainable message in terms of system preservation or system justification, mm -hmm. it's very appealing to conservatives. Mm -hmm. If you frame it in terms of, you know, system disruption or you emphasize things like, you know, high degrees of, um, you know, enhancing or increasing uh, individual autonomy mm -hmm. or something like that, then it then it goes the other way. So I, I, I was totally resonant with what we know about consumer behavior. And but that's really what we have found when I've yeah. talked to more conservative investors. The thing that they find most interesting is when I talk to them about solar loan and leases, like mm -hmm. getting solar panels on mm -hmm. their own homes or their own buildings or their yeah. own businesses. They find that as an autonomous opportunity mm -hmm. or an ability to control more yeah. of their own future. And it resonates with them. And they're like, oh, yeah, and it's good for the environment. Yeah. I can also add from you know sure. business perspective, even if regulations were to kind of ease up in terms of emissions in the US, let's just say hypothetically, you know, is an automaker gonna start making less efficient vehicles, right? That's not in line with consumer preferences and it's also not in line with international standards, right? So I think um, you know, it's not just necessarily what the regulation is, but what makes business sense for companies? Are, are they really gonna change their behavior in response to, to something like that? We have a question specifically about behavior actually. Um, this person is saying that behavioral studies have illustrated that emotions can lead to bad investment decisions. Mm -hmm. How do you, or how do you, do you need to, make sure that you keep emotions out of an inherently emotional style of investing? Kate? Well, it's funny. I, I worked with one company that told me that what they've observed is that um, any decision made after about 11 p.m., is a terrible decision. <laughs> like, just slow down your website after 10 or 11 p.m. because nobody is getting on there making wise decisions, right? Um, and, and honestly, um, there are places where you can look at your data and just know nothing good is happening at 2 a.m., friends. Like, and so what do you do in that case? You put in a little, what we call some kind of sludge, right? So you would do something where it, something pops up and it's like, you sure you want to do this? How about you revisit this at 8 a.m.? Um, we just know that people make decisions in different conditions and it affects them. Um, I think it, what's, what I found very interesting about um, emotions and finances um, is that you can't take the emotion out of it. Like We can say it's a totally objective decision. It will not be. Um, there's going to be pride or there's going to be a sense of self-actualization or there's going to be happiness, there's going to be fear, there's going to be sadness. They're there. So I, while emotions can cloud your decision making, they, decision making, they can also help you find what really matters to you. Um, so what you want to do is, if you can, um, work in an emotional state that is conducive to analytic processing. And in fact, um, that means uh, that you, in, you know, when we study emotions in general, a slightly negative <laughs> frame of mind right, is better for analytic decision making and a fairly low level of arousal. Right, so that gives you a certain set of emotions to work with that will actually make you make better decisions. Now, if you're going to work with things like shock, surprise, horror, you're going to get bad decisions. But there are emotions that can help you. So I wouldn't give up on emotions altogether. They, they can be very useful for you. We had a question that just came in about the limited ESG track records we have. So we have got research and history um, you know, for the last 10 years, let's say, mm -hmm. around ESG. Um, what does that history show us about how ESG performs during periods of financial stress? A lot of that's after mm -hmm. the financial mm -hmm. crisis. Do we think that's going to hold up if we experience that again, Steve? Yeah, I think that, and I can speak only to, to fixed income, which, which is my area of expertise. In my mind, and I think we have seen this bear out, if you're using ESG and, and impact investing correctly, in fixed income, ESG is actually a competitive advantage. 
And that's because how you generate excess return over long periods of time <laughs> in fixed income isn't by picking winners, it's by avoiding losers. Mm -hmm. And that's because of the asymmetric payoff profile associated with the, with the bond. So what you're doing, if you're doing your ESG analysis correctly, is you're simply identifying the best operated and managed issuers, so the ones less likely to blow up over time. And it, and it isn't just, you know, our performance record has been good to date, um, but we've seen both Barclays and, and B of A have done pieces last year that took within the corporate space U.S. IG and high yield and European IG and high yield and regressed returns between high-scored ESG issuers and low-scored ESG issuers. And in all four quadrants, high ESG issuers outperform. Mm -hmm. And again, that makes sense because of the nature of how you generate excess return. And going to what you were just saying a second ago about the emotion of it, what we try, to, the way I try to think about ESG is that we're not making a value judgment. Mm -hmm. What we're trying to say is this is an additional lens of information or thought that you have to use in evaluating a security. We're not saying don't invest in an oil and gas company. What we're saying is you don't want to invest in an oil and gas company that has a poor track record on the environment because if they're constantly being fined, if they lose business because they have poor environmental track record, mm -hmm. what they're doing is putting at risk their free cash flow generation, which limits their ability to repay you, especially as generally an unsecured creditor. So it's a different thought process in how you go about evaluating, and that's really critical and fixed where you're generally an unsecured borrower and your payoff profile, again, is asymmetric against you. Nobody's going to congratulate you for getting your money back on a security, but they're really going to be upset if you lose it. I love what you're doing here with risk, right? Because you're flipping risk. You're right. saying there's more risk in being unsustainable than being sustainable. That's a simple message, mm -hmm. and it will resonate. You know, so if you can keep it that simple, I think it, I think it's brilliant. Thankfully, right? I'm not that smart, right. so I don't have a lot of options. <laughs> so, like, like all the other differences in the investments yeah. are interesting, but I think that message is is going to work for people. And we see that at least in in one in my fund that's been around almost ten years at this point, where we have a GIPS track record. We see our upside downside capture chart show. We see where we benefit in a dislocated environment, mm -hmm. and I think that is because those ESG factors are helping us to avoid issuers that are outside the norm in performance, mm -hmm. like, again, going way back, Enron, Vo you know, WorldCom, Tyco, Volkswagen, you miss Ford, you miss Pat Gas, so you miss those issuers that have a track record that's poor in, in an ESG factor, so you avoid that performance, negative performance impact to your strategies. Mm -hmm. Taking this a step further, how long before all investments in a given portfolio will be viewed through the lens of impact as opposed to a side portfolio or a piece of a portfolio? Any of you guys want to jump in? I can Laura. jump in. I mean, I think we're getting close. One uh, unique thing we've done at UBS is we've actually created a fully sustainable asset allocation. So uh, we've kind of mapped out, you know, what percent of the portfolio to have in various um, ESG vehicles. So, you know, on the fixed income side, how much to allocate to, you know, green bonds uh, versus multilateral uh, development bank bonds. And then looking at the different equity categories like ESG leaders, ESG thematic, ESG improvers. So we've mapped that out. And our goal was to have really the same kind of risk return profile as a traditional asset allocation. So that's one step in mm -hmm. the right direction. Um, also, just looking at some survey data we've done of our investor population, um, over 50% of our you know, survey respondents said that they expect over the next decade that ESG is going to become the norm. So I do think we are seeing um, sustainable investing really um, start to be more mainstream. And I think a lot of it goes back to um, the innovation that we've seen in the field and kind of moving from you know, exclusionary uh, strategies toward more strategies that are oriented toward um, purely, you know, maximizing risk and return. So I, I think we are um, kind of on the brink of that at this point. Would like, you like to add anything there? I mean, I, I think that depends upon how you you frame the concept of impact. You know, like mm -hmm. for, for our strategies, you know, we the only way in is you're either an ESG leader, which we've defined, or we're an, you're an impact investment, which means you have direct and measurable outcomes. So Think of, like I mentioned, solar loan and leases or a solar power project or af affordable housing, things like that. Um, so for us, we would say that if you're generating a higher ESG quality to your portfolio, that is a form of impact. Um, it just depends upon what individuals are looking for because I think one of the you know, challenges slash opportunities in this space 
um, which hopefully means I'm thinking of things in a slightly negative perspective, <laughs> um, is that what everyone considers impactful is different. So we have to make sure that we're pre presenting strategies that the investor can understand what we're attempting to do and understand so that they can make a determination if that fits with what they're looking for as an investment because not everyone is going to agree. Right, and I would just add to, you know, I kind of took the term very liberally, like some of the strategy I just described, I wouldn't necessarily call those impact investments, but more falling under this broader umbrella of sustainable mm -hmm. um, investments because we tend to have a more narrow uh, definition of what true impact is in terms of being able to measure outcomes. I just want to clarify. Great. And it'll be, let me add one more thing. Please. It'll be interesting to see how, how this goes because if everybody has it, right, if there's a piece of information that's common across all options, it doesn't matter anymore. Right? And so it'll be interesting to see if there's a way to keep a contrast item available that's like, okay, this is what it looks like when you're not doing ESG, and you can have that option. Right? People don't want to be shoved into this. Nobody mm -hmm. likes being preached at. Nobody wants to be told this is the only option. It would be an interesting experiment to say, okay, we're also going to create a set that just does not care about that. Mm -hmm. And if you want that, you can have it too. That will, that will help you retain the meaning mm -hmm. of the ESG fund. Right. If, if everybody's got it, it's going to lose the pull that it has. We have two that just came in on a similar theme. Um, the first one is, how do you see the municipal bond market playing a role in ESG as municipalities need to spend more on infrastructure in the future? Mm -hmm. And then the related one is asking about municipalities ranking on ESG. So thinking about things like police relations or tax cuts, um, affordable housing you mentioned. So just both of those pieces. Why don't you start, Steve? Sure. Um, you know, within my strategies, we certainly have a pretty material exposure to taxable municipals, um, and that is primarily due to securities that fit into our impact framework. So it, they are direct and measurable. There is, of course, the argument being made that all municipalities, regardless when they issue, are trying to do something for the common good. Um, that's certainly an argument that some people will make. Um, we have stuck primarily to securities that have a direct and measurable outcome. And, and municipalities are great because they do have such a wide variety of responsibilities and, and potential um, for making impactful decisions, whether it is affordable housing or putting solar panels on wastewater treatment facilities or expanding clean water service and, and sewer service to more rural parts of the country. One of the more impactful deals I think that we've done this year that I think are inter is interesting is we worked with a county in a rural part of Arkansas to fund a vocational school. So six school districts are going to feed into a 540 seat vocational school that's going to focus on electrical, plumbing, carpentry, HVAC, very highly technical jobs, highly skilled jobs that we are in severe shortage of in the U.S. that carry an above market wage and benefit to them. So that in, in, in funding for that across the country has been severely limited. Um, so it's an opportunity, I think, because of the nature of what municipalities do and, and what their purpose is, you have opportunities to find securities that really have, first and foremost, an attractive total return profile, but also feed a need or resolve or serve a need that we know investors care about. Kate, I have two for you that came in during your panel. The first one is, the, is the pro proliferation of data actually making it harder for investors to make decisions? Is there too much data now? And then related to that, knowing that there are, our audience today has a lot of retail investors, can you talk about how they should present that data to their, mm. to their clients or what data they should be presenting? Yeah, so I think um, there are lots of people, being buried in data is never good, um, but I'm not the kind of person who's gonna say, therefore we should not have data, okay? Mm. Um, a lot of it does have to do with presentation. Um, and so, you know, I think that we know by this point that the simplest depiction is going to be the most useful. Um, people are very focused on, and again, we already do this, people are already focused on their, their past history. That's the reference point. So whatever I've experienced last year becomes my reference point. That's meaningful data. Um, however, you might also want to consider um, presenting data that has to do with people like you, you know, what they're up to, what's happening for them. You also might want to allow people to develop scenarios um, that represent something that's aspirational for them. Right, so that they can see, look, here's what this would look like. Here's what, the, what data you need to get to the place you need to go. Um, but I, I always worry, I, I have written papers on information overload and choice overload. It is absolutely real. Giving, dumping data on people is not transparency. It's actually, it's actually more of a, like a, it's more of a hiding factor than it is a transparency factor. Um, but uh, I think that you will have consumers who want all the data. They want to dig into it. So that, 
easier you can make it for them to look for what they want to find, the better. Um, there's no single right answer for all consumers, but I think you can start to figure out, you know, in terms of segments, who cares about what, give them that. We haven't talked about this a ton today, but one of the ways a lot of people are investing personally is through their own 401ks. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of companies who have ESG 401k plans. What are the major impediments there? What are the catalysts that could, that could integrate more of those? How about Steve? Um, yeah, we certainly have seen an uptick in company interest in providing either ESG suites or ESG tiers of options within their 401k. I think that, you know, to be, to be fair to the businesses, um, I think that the asset management industry up until recently has not done a great job of providing ESG and impact strategies that are able to perform well against peers and common benchmarks. So I think now that we're getting to a place where there are more options that stand up from a performance perspective, um, that there is an increasing interest. And that combines with you know, what, what y'all were talking about earlier is the data that we see from our responsible investment team shows that 75% of, of female investors are interested in this concept of ESG and impact, 75% of millennial investors. Well, the two fastest growing sets of investors are female and millennial investors. So, I think that once it becomes obvious that you get past, I mean, I've been doing this for 15 years, and no matter who I talk to, the first comment I have to give somebody is, you do not sacrifice performance to be a responsible investor. It's, it's just the first thing that everyone thinks about, and up until recently, we haven't had an entire suite of products that shows that that is true. Um, and so now we're getting there, so I think I expect that we'll see between the performance being there as well as investor demand you'll see more companies adding those types of products or tiering to their, to their suite, to their suite of, of offerings. Yeah, I mean, I would also add maybe just from the perspective of pension plan uh, managers, because that's a very unique situation where you're acting in a trustee capacity. Uh, the Department of Labor has actually issued guidance on this topic uh, a, a few times, and they've refined <laughs> it over time. Um, but essentially, back in 2015, they acknowledged ESG considerations as you know, economic considerations that have a, a real impact on risk and return. So I think this helped to clear up some you know, confusion. If you're sitting in a you know, fiduciary capacity, can you um, actually incorporate ESG? Or if you do, are you, you know, going against your duty? Are you sacrificing... Uh, the return potential of the of the of the plan. So I think that's you know kind of been an important um, you know set of guidance there in terms of you know how this information can be used in that context and really speaks to kind of the, some of the points that you made, Steve. What about emerging markets? Is that a big opportunity? Or are we going to see more happening with responsible investing in emerging markets? Um, how about Steve? Oh sure. <laughs> um, yeah, we are. We've been fortunate. We have, um, as I mentioned, we have 50 analysts and 12 mm -hmm. traders, so we, we cover the globe from from an analytical perspective, and from an impact perspective, we've had very good luck working with emerging market issuers. Um, they've been fantastic about providing data and in, in information, which we sometimes don't even really get from U.S. Fortune 500 mm -hmm. companies, which I always find is an interesting dichotomy. Um, and we also think that if you, if, again, if you're doing it correctly and we look for primarily for impact investments in those markets, we feel as though the, the magnitude of impact is slightly higher in an emerging market country than what you would find in a developing country. And, and we think of it, you know, a, a good example would again be their grids. You know, their power grids in developing countries tend to be more um, fossil fuel oriented versus a developed country. Um, so if you're funding a geothermal plant in Indonesia, for example, that you know, provides enough power for about 213,000 homes and displaces enough car about a million six carbon um, dioxide, tons of carbon dioxide annually, which is equal to taking about 300,000 cars off the road. You have a, and those are just US averages. So doing that project in Indonesia, you would have a higher magnitude of impact because of power demands in Indonesia are slightly lower than in the US, um, and, and the carbon offset would be slightly higher. So we, we found that those are opportunities. Um, and obviously that's still a space, though, where general ESG data and reporting is still evolving and, and it's getting better on a daily basis. Um, so I expect that we'll see a continued um, diversification into EM, especially as more EM issuers come to the U.S. dollar market. For people in the audience today who want to learn more about this, 
obviously step one, attend Griff, step two, read Bloomberg. But what are the other things that, that you guys think that they should be doing to ed better educate themselves on these issues, things they should be reading, people they should be talking to? There's a lot of good um, you know, academic research being done on the topic. Uh, Harvard Business Review has a lot of uh, really compelling articles in this space, so I would definitely uh, recommend checking out you know, their website and some of the content they have. Um, Kate, talk, this is kind of sound silly, talk to people, yeah. <laughs> talk to actual people. Like um, we were talking earlier about um, some of the issues with the survey data that we collect, right? And um, what you can get at a macro level with a scalable tool is one type of information, um, but what you can get from talking to your Uber driver is another. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, I, and we know we don't want to move on anecdotal evidence, we know that, um, but from the consumer side, it at least help you to ask some different questions. And I think that that's interesting. The other thing is, again, I would say look at analogous areas um, where you see people trying to make a change in broad scale, financially consequential behavior. And see what's working, what do you see? Because we're just humans making decisions about different ideas and products and experiences. That's where I would go. In our last minute, I want a quick answer from each of the three of you on what do you think RI will look like in five years? Laura, let's start with you. Oh, man. <laughs> Um, I think uh, it will be increasingly mainstream, as I think I already said earlier, but I think we're going to see, at least at the ESG integration level, that become very commonplace. Um, at the end of the day, it's just additional information. So if you're um, a portfolio manager, why wouldn't you at least consider it, look at it, uh, think about how it might improve your decision making? I also would add that on the impact side, I think there'll be increased product innovation, so more creative strategies in terms of how we can funnel capital mm -hmm. towards solving some of these um, you know, major global challenges that we'll be facing in the coming decade, whether it's you know, water shortages, uh, you know, food shortages, um, air pollution, all of these major issues we're going to face. I think there's a big opportunity within the impact space to get more capital um, allocated to those areas. Um, I would think that it's just going to be much more commonplace, that it will be a conversation that you have with your, your clients on a much more frequent basis, on a much more regular basis, where you, you have to be able to understand really what they're looking for um, within their portfolios so that you're able to align their holdings with their actual values. Um, so I just expect that this is a conversation that will become much more frequent and much more common um, and, and much more... Um, in depth as well, in that the, the, that there could be a situ the situation now where it feels like maybe clients are coming in, um, they're going to be looking for additional information and looking for you to, to provide them more color, more context around what can be done to, to structure their portfolios in a way that align with what they're thinking because they're going to be in a position to understand they're not sacrificing returns and in a lot of cases they may be generating excess mm -hmm. return because of it. I think two things. I think one thing is the language is going to change. We're going to come up with better words for this because these words don't mean much to people anymore. Sustainable, who knows what that means. I think we're going to come up with something else. There's going to be a new language that evolves, and I think there's going to be, there are going to be one or two companies that figure out how to differentiate. Um, and it's not just going to be table stakes. Somebody's going to get really good at this. Mm -hmm. um, and that's going to be really interesting to see. Great. Please join me in thanking Laura, Kate, and Stephen for answering your questions. <laughs>